Sunday. My name is Ryan. I'm the youth pastor here. Because uh, I'm the youth pastor and we're in a series called Food, uh, I thought it would be appropriate uh, to ask a question this morning. So here's my question. What is the most disgusting food that you have ever eaten? Wasabi beans? What? Wasabi what? Gross. Okay. What else? What is that? Celery root. Okay, celery root. What about back there? Back there. Canned Brussels sprouts. Okay. Liver. Ooh, so how many of you actually like liver? Some people like liver. Okay. Pastor Mark, what were you going to say? What was that? Pho with dog meat. I, I was thinking about the most disgusting foods that I've eaten, and I think uh, I had an unfortunate number of stories to choose from. But the one that really stuck out was uh, we were in China a couple years ago, um, which already is starting in a scary place. We're in China, and we're going up to this village that's eight hours away from a town, and we're going up to celebrate a wedding uh, for some villagers in this town that's really far away. So wedding day means feast day, and so they've prepared the best of the best for us to come and eat. We actually had two feasts that day. We had a lunch feast and a dinner feast, and they're bringing out all of their delicacies. They're bringing out intestine soup, uh, they're bringing out chicken feet. Uh, they're bringing out really every part of an animal you could have thought possible. Pig hooves, pig brains. Uh, and, they're eat- and we're eating this and, you know, smiling. And because, you know, it's, a, it's a, an honor culture, so we have to receive, you know, what, what they give us to honor them. And also, you know, Jesus commands it in Luke 10, eat what's set before you, so we have to eat it. And the, the, we're, we're at the end of this meal, and we've eaten every part of an animal that I thought was even possible. And then they bring out their, their creme de la creme. They bring out their fancy special dish, the the prize of the meal, and it's this bowl, and in this bowl, there's these giant brown blobs that are wiggling a little bit, and set them down. And we all smile, kind of like this, and ask them, what's what's this? And it has to go through, you know, we were speaking English to somebody who spoke Mandarin and Chinese, and then that person who spoke Mandarin Chinese had to translate it to the local dialect, and then from the local dialect back to Mandarin, back to us. And, uh, and so we're asked, what is this? And by the time it comes back to us, we learn that these giant brown blobs are boiled blood vessels. <laughs> and we're looking at them. And I'm at this table, there's two tables, and at this table, I'm the team leader, and everyone's kind of looking at me like, do we have to eat this? And I realize as the team leader, I have to be the one that goes first. So I take my chopstick, stab it. I don't know if it's possible for it to be alive, but like just in case, trying to make sure here, eat it. Can anyone imagine what blood-flavored jello tastes like? I love telling these stories. I'm a youth pastor. But uh, the worst part was we found out later that the table next to us, uh, the table next to us, that the team leader at that table had actually told the locals that eating blood was against our religion, so we can't eat that. So I made my table eat it, and the other table didn't eat it. So my wife has still never had boiled blood vessels, but someday I'm going to cook it just for you, babe. You know, there's always a risk to eat at a table. And in China, you know, it's the risk of crazy foods and food poisoning and all of that. But a little bit closer to home, to sit at a table in community, there's a risk of being vulnerable. There's a risk of overcoming fear of being close to one another. There's a risk that somebody we get close to could hurt us. In Acts chapter 2, we see the early church, they meet, um, it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 46, day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. We see it's part of the daily life of the early church that they're meeting together, not just at a temple, but at a table. 
What I want to ask this morning is, what's the risk that God's inviting us to take to sit at the table with one another? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your presence that's here this morning. God, we thank you for the gift of your presence as here in worship. God, we thank you for the gift of your kingdom expanding through all these building deals. God, we thank you for the gift of your presence with us right now. And Lord, we just pray for a sensitivity uh, to hear your word uh, this morning. I just want to pray for some people in the room, just close, uh, with everybody's eyes closed, if you're in this room and you felt kind of numb, and and as we sang that song about lighting a fire again, you want God to light a fresh fire in your heart. Just with eyes closed, can you slip your hand up? I'd love to pray for you. God, we pray for refreshment. God, that that numbness of emotion would, would be softened this morning through, through the, the warmth of your word as we sit at, sit at your table this morning. God, come and refresh us and fill us up. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. So we see in Acts chapter 2, they're coming together at the temple, uh, which of course at that time is the Jewish temple, but I think really represents this picture uh, of these big gatherings where everybody's coming together to worship God. And then they go from the temple day by day uh, to their tables, which I think represents these sort of smaller uh, gatherings in homes, around tables, around meals. And for many of us, we find ourselves on the same continuum 2,000 years later, gathering together for big capital C church temple type meetings, and then also gathering around tables in our homes. And uh, many of you know my story, but I really encountered God at a winter camp uh, back when I was a sophomore in high school. My heart uh, got set free, and it was this giant gathering. There's 300 plus people there, and I really met God at this temple type moment. How many of you have encountered God in a big capital C church meeting before? I mean, there's value to this, Um, but I was uh, sharing my story with someone the other day, and I I shared about that moment, and then I shared how shortly after that, Pastor Brandon uh, decided to open his home to the high schoolers, and he invited us over to his house, and we began to study the scriptures and eat meals together on Tuesday nights, and 70 high schoolers would fill his home to eat dinner uh, and read the Bible. And the way I explained it was this way, as I met God at that temple moment, that encounter moment, but I learned how to follow him at a table. And for many of us, it's the tables of our lives are the places where we really learn how to live out this story day by day. And so last week, Pastor Brandon did an amazing job uh, taking us through the story of Scripture or the meta narrative of Scripture through the lens of temple and really encouraged us to ask, uh, what are those uh, things that we've let in to to defile our temple, to defile the body of Christ? And this morning, uh, what I want to do is I want to take us through that story again quickly Uh, instead of looking at the lens of temple, look at it through the lens of table. Or another way we could say this is through the lens of the families that meet at those tables. Everyone say families. So in Genesis chapter 1, God creates the heavens and the earth. And Pastor Brandon did an amazing job of talking how if you were living in an ancient Near Eastern culture, what this would have sounded like is this would have sounded like a temple building account. It would have sounded like the construction of a temple. Uh, but in Genesis 1:28, uh, God places, 27 and 28, he places a man and a woman. He says he creates male and female. And then it says God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. So God creates this big creation. He creates this big temple, but right in the middle of it, he places a marriage. Right in the middle of it, he places a man and a woman and commands them to fill the earth by having kids, by creating family. And so God says, fill the earth with my presence, with my glory. Uh, But the way that you're going to do that is through this vehicle of family. And that's the means by which God wants to fill the earth with his presence. And then we see in Genesis chapter 3, things start to go wrong. The snake uh, comes into the garden and ultimately tempts uh, Adam and Eve to eat this fruit. And here's what I want us to notice, again, going through the story, through the lens of table, through the lens of family, through the lens of meals, is that the primary time uh, when sin and sickness enter into human history is a moment over the question of food and what food is appropriate to eat. If we may, sin and sickness enter humanity at a table. 
And so God establishes family and meals and community as the way to establish his presence all over the earth. But then sin and sickness enter into that very same marriage, that very same table over a meal. And then a few thousand years later, God sets on this course to redeem and restore the world. And he chooses someone named Abram. You might know him as Abraham. And in Genesis chapter 12, it says this. It says, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. What we have to remember is, is when God's telling Abram to leave his family, he's not going off all by himself. He's taking his household with him. And so when God says to Abram, leave your family, he's talking about his kind of extended family, but he's still taking his wife, his kids, his servants, uh, and, his, and his animals. I mean, probably a group of 40 or 50 people in Abram's household um, that, that are going out. So God actually chooses a family to begin his restoration mission. And then at the end, it says, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And once again, we see this picture of God's presence, God's blessing covering the entire earth and the vehicle that God wants to use to do it is family. The vehicle through which God wants to redeem and restore the world is family. And then when we fast forward... um, to a, a kind of a few, a couple hundred years later, Abram has kids that have kids that have kids that have kids, and then eventually it's the nation of Israel, and, and they're trapped in Egypt, and they're slaves in Egypt. And the most significant story in the Hebrew Bible is the story of the Exodus, where God liberates his people from slavery. But the way that God chooses to do that is before they're set free, uh, he instructs them to have a meal. And we today call that meal, does anyone know? Passover, as a way to celebrate God's liberation from slavery, almost as if to redeem the meal that brought sin and sickness. Now there's a new meal that brings salvation and freedom. God uses a meal. He uses a table. He uses family. And fast forward a few more years in, in Malachi, um, and we don't have a slide for this, but in Malachi, um, this is not the last book in the Hebrew Bible that's written, uh, but it is one of the last books. And it's actually at the end uh, of our uh, Hebrew Bible. It's the end of the, the recorded uh, uh, books that we have. And what it does is it kind of ends the story on sort of this cliffhanger. Uh, does anyone hate it when TV shows end with cliffhangers? It's like you have to watch the next one. It makes Netflix binging so easy because you just keep going. But there's this cliffhanger moment at the end of the Hebrew Bible uh, where, where a Malachi I prophesize, and he says, Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents. He says, hey, everything's broken. This is all broken. Based on that meal in Genesis 3, everything's broken. But when redemption comes, it's going to look like parents turning to their children and children turning to their parents. It's going to look like a restoration of family. And then when Luke writes Luke chapter 1, and he's talking about the ministry of John the Baptist, and again, John the Baptist comes to prepare the way of Jesus, Luke actually echoes this this prophecy in Malachi and says, this is what's happening. The redemption and restoration of the world is coming. And the way he describes it is in Luke chapter 1, it says, uh, with the spirit and power of Elijah, John the Baptist will go before Jesus to turn the hearts of parents to their children. Luke says, in Jesus, this restoration of family is here. So when we look at the life of Jesus, how does Jesus do family? Well, at the beginning of his ministry, uh, in Matthew chapter 4, he's walking along a sea, and he chooses two brothers and says to them, come and follow me. And those two brothers actually leave their natural family to follow Jesus and join this sort of extended family of spiritual brothers, the disciples, and of spiritual sisters like Mary and Mary Magdalene. And, and Jesus starts to do life with these people. Uh, and Matthew chapter 8 tells us they spend a lot of their time at Peter's mom's 
house. What's Jesus doing? He's, he's redefining family and restoring family as this extended family of God that's doing life together a lot of the time at tables. Uh, it's been said that uh, if you take all the meals and mountains out of the Bible, you'd have almost nothing left. And that's really true in the Gospels. Jesus spends so much of his time at meals, at tables. Uh, really, you might be surprised, some of our favorite Gospel stories, some of us have grown up with in Sunday school, um, actually take place at a table. And Jesus is sharing these meals and sharing life with these people. And there's even this cryptic story in Matthew um, chapter, uh, or sorry, Luke chapter 8. In Luke chapter 8, it says, Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And we do, we do have a slide for this. And he was told, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. But Jesus says to them, My mother and brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. And I used to read this verse and be like, what does that even mean? Uh, but if you think about it in the context of Jesus restoring family as the vehicle through which God wants to redeem and restore the world, it actually makes total sense. Jesus is redefining family based on those who hear the word of God and do it. He's establishing his people as a family. And then in the book of Acts, Jesus lives this. He lives life around the table. In the book of Acts chapter 2, we see the early church living life around the table. And how the early church lives, Paul eventually gives language to and says the body of Christ is meant to be brothers and sisters. He describes himself as a spiritual father in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, do you know that the church gathered around a meal before they ever gathered for a meeting? The church gathered around community before they ever gathered around conferences and services. The church gathered around a table before they ever gathered for a talk and a sermon. And if you think about it, if we can go meta, even, even God himself, the language God uses to describe himself is as a father that sends a son. The vehicle God chooses to redeem and restore the world is family. So I want to ask us this morning, where are the tables in our life? Where are the places that we gather for community, for that shared life together, that richness of life together? I think we can all think of some tables in our life uh, where we're so enjoying being with the people we're with that it's like time stands still. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Those tables. I think of uh, Thanksgiving dinner growing up. Again, not all of us were blessed to, to grow up in an amazing family. I, I have so many fond memories thinking back to Thanksgiving with the mashed potatoes and the gravy and the jello and the corn and the turkey. And, and really, most of all, what I remember, though, is losing track of time at that table because we're so enjoying each other's presence. I think of um, actually the moment I remember the most from my wedding uh, is Morgan and I decided that we wanted our own separate table. Uh, we weren't going to sit with our wedding party. When I think back to my wedding, most of the time I remember that moment when we were sitting, eating together, and it was just us at our table. Why? Because time stood still. We were so caught up in the richness of life together. I think of, uh, we just graduated a, a third year of our discipleship school, the Rock Discipleship Community, and for the past three years on one night a week, we've had a group of 18, 19-year-olds, and we learned early on uh, that we didn't want to do it like, like a meeting. We, we wanted to do it around a table because there's something about that table uh, that breaks down walls. And I think back over the past three years so many times where it's like time stood still because of the richness of our life together. So where are those tables in your life? I think for many of us, if we're honest with ourselves, when we think of the tables in our life, some of us, it's hard uh, to think about the tables in our life because maybe some of us have broken table legs. Maybe some of us have tables where uh, we're afraid. 
uh, because we've been hurt by community in the past, so it's scary to think about sharing life with someone else. Maybe uh, the tables in our life are, are broken uh, because of uh, a really a, a lack of trust of people around us. Maybe I feel like for some of us, our tables are broken because we're really lonely, and we've gotten so used to being lonely that it's scary to even think about doing life with others. Where, where are the broken tables? Where are the broken table legs in our life? So that's the first question I want to ask. The second question I want to ask is, is there room at your table? If you read the story of Jesus, he eats with so many people. He eats with tax collectors. He eats with sinners. He eats with prostitutes. He eats with Pharisees. He eats with his disciples. He eats with the sick, the demon-possessed. Jesus eats with the whole host of people. There's so much room at his table. My question is, is there room at our table for people, uh, not just in this room, but people outside of it as well? Uh, Christine Pohl is an amazing writer on community, and she, she, says, she says this, and I just think it's so powerful. Um, she says, the character of our shared life as congregations, communities, and families has the power to draw people to the kingdom or to push them away. How we live together is the most persuasive sermon we ever get to preach. And later on, she talks about how, uh, for many of us in the modern world, our homes have become places of hiding, uh, places that are private and restful, and and places where we really escape from the world. And she, she challenges us to think, are our homes places of hiding, or are our homes places of hospitality? Because there's an opportunity, she says, for homes can become small outposts of God's kingdom. And I would add to that, tables can become small outposts of God's kingdom, places where heaven touches earth. And I think a lot of us are used to thinking of the temple, uh, again, quote, uh, temple, this large gathering place as the place where we experience heaven on earth. A lot of us are used to, you know, we need, in order for heaven to touch earth, man, we need the bands, we need some words of knowledge, we need some healing, uh, we need, and we're used to temple being the place where heaven touches earth. But the, do you know heaven can also touch earth at a table? Uh, a group of friends and I, we used to, uh, on, when, when we had Saturday night services, we'd all go to a restaurant together, the same restaurant every week after Saturday night service. And we had a waiter, uh, Johnny, who helped us every time. And we were just nice to him. We were just us. It's kind of the same group of people. Every Saturday, Alec was there, Morgan was there, and uh, we're there every week. And, and one day, Johnny sits down with us. He's our waiter. And he says, hey, uh, do you know what they call you guys in the back? We're like, I don't know, what do they call us? And he says, they call you the table of angels. And we're like, wow, that's awesome. Like, why? And he says, well, there's just something about you guys. And I'm trying to quote him exactly. This is what he says. He says, there's something about you guys that's so different. How do I get what you have? We're like, well, we love Jesus, like we'll pr- we'd love to pray for you. And so we wait till he's off, after, off his uh, shift. He, we, he, we take him outside when he's done with the shift. He starts to share with us how one of his friends had just committed suicide and how we'd been the bright beacon of light in his week ever since. Tables are places where heaven can touch earth. We weren't doing anything special. I tell you, we weren't praying or making it this super spiritual meal. There's just the power of our shared life together that can draw people into the kingdom of God. Uh, But some of us aren't making room at our tables. Can I... Can I just talk, so some of us don't make room uh, at our tables because they're broken, and some of us have broken spots. Um, can I just talk to the, uh, the millennials for a second? Where are my millennials at? Um, and this might apply, this probably will apply to others too, but uh, uh, I think for millennials, some of us don't have room at the table because we're waiting for a different table. And if you look at social media, and that's what millennials really have grown up with, is there's almost this like illusion 
of the perfect community out there somewhere. And we like other people's pictures. We're like, man, they just have so much fun with one another. Man, I don't really like my community. You might not verbalize that, but, but the way we verbalize it is by dreaming of a better community that's out there somewhere. Can I, can I let you in on a secret? Maybe no one's ever told you this before. There's no such thing as a perfect community. There's no such thing. Every community has weirdos. How many of you are sitting next to the community weirdo right now, okay? <laughs> How many of you are getting convicted? Maybe I'm the community weirdo. Oh my gosh. I never thought about it. Listen, we can't compare the community God's given us to somebody else's photoshopped fantasy, okay? I, I think the biggest enemy for community, especially for, for my generation, so even my generation, is this illusion of the perfect community that's out there somewhere. And what it does is it gets us to prevent building roots where we are. And actually, uh, and I learned this from, from my friend Adam, he, he talks about the root of the word radical. All, all millennials, we have these radical dreams. We want to see the world. We want to travel the world. How many of you, you're a millennial, you want to travel the world? You want to travel the world. So uh, we have this dream. We want to be radical. We want to do things for God. Actually, if you study the history of the word radical, the history of the word it actually comes from the word rooted. And it's actually a plant word, and it has to do with plants that have radical branches that extend really far in different directions. And in order to have those radical branches, uh, plants need to have deep roots. In order to go far, you have to go deep. There's no such thing as the perfect community. Don't find the perfect community, build it. That's an 11 a.m. special because there's not a lot of millennials in the 9 a.m. So <laughs> we're all sleeping. So some of us don't have room at the table because it's broken. Some of us don't have room at the table because we're looking at other people's tables. But some of us, if we're honest, don't have room at our table because we're busy. And uh, I, I remember as I was studying this, uh, this, this message and I looked at my table, my actual physical table in my kitchen just to see what was there. And I mean, if I can be honest with you, on that table was uh, a, a bag full of Tupperware containers from my lunches this week. I hadn't washed yet. There was a bag of things that my mom dropped off at my house that I, a month ago that I haven't put away yet. There was a bag that was tied closed. I was afraid to look in it because I didn't want to put it away. Um, how many of you, if you're honest, your table looks maybe a little bit like mine. There's lots of other things on it. Uh, and I think that's kind of a picture for some of us how our spiritual lives are, that there's so much stuff on our table that there's not room for us to engage in community. There's so many commitments. There's so many sports schedules and jobs and that uh, feeling that we need more rest. And if you're a young family, you genuinely do probably need more rest. I understand that. If you're a millennial and you think you need more rest, that's a lie, okay? You're lying to yourself. I'm speaking to myself, okay? There's things that we fill our life with and that we say that we're busy and we use it as an excuse to not engage in the very vehicle that God wants to use to redeem and restore the world. And I just want to say this, the invitation this morning is not for us to add more community group meetings to our life. The invitation is to do what we're already doing and do it together. I want to speak to the young families and then every generation over young families, the, the boomers and, and everyone above. I, I would just want to say this. As a young person in this church family, uh, we are so desperate to see what a family that loves Jesus looks like. And I got so healed sitting around young families' dinner tables, seeing how they lived, seeing how they prayed before their meal, seeing how they disciplined their kids. And I just want to say, I think prophetically, God's speaking to some young families. Uh, we, as the younger generation, we're not waiting for the perfect family. We just want to see a living family. And I got so healed seeing even young families make mistakes 
because they did it with the grace of Jesus. So don't wait for a perfect family. Do what you're already doing together. Invite people over to the dinner. Invite people to the sports games. How many of you have heard of uh, the Clapham sect? Has anyone heard of the Clapham sect? I just want to see where we're at. So well, you guys were here at the 9 a.m., so I don't know if that, if that counts. So um, <laughs> let's practice. It's a, Clapham's a British word. Let's practice our British pronunciation. Everyone say Clapham. And I won't do it with a British accent because I don't want to embarrass myself. But it's this group of people, uh, around 20 or 30 of them, and they, uh, there's, and they lived in England in, in the 1800s, early 1800s, and they decided uh, to move into a low-income neighborhood in London that was famous for its drunkenness. So this group of 20 or 30, they're Christians, group of 20 or 30 Christians move in. They all buy houses really close to one another in this neighborhood where even the governor of this town, uh, this little township, Clapham, uh, was famous for being drunk. And they move in and get him ousted and replace him with a governor that loves Jesus. And so they move into this town, and they all make a commitment. They say, hey, we're going to do this, this extended family thing, like Jesus modeled. We're going to do this life together. And so individually, all of them had a rule of life. They committed to pray for two hours a day. So I know many of us in here probably already do that, so check. We're good. That's a joke if you're new and you're like, oh, my gosh. No, we don't. <laughs> um, pray for two hours a day. And then they make a commitment that they're going to worship together in each other's homes twice a week. And so they worship together in each other's homes twice a week. And then they have an open door policy with one another that at any point in time, they can go to each other's houses. So they're doing this life together thing. They're not doing more. They're just doing it together. And in about 20 or 30 years, um, I'm going to read you a list of accomplishments that this community accomplished. They were, they were very politically active, uh, morally active in their community. So are you ready to be convicted? Okay. Here's what this group of 20 or 30 people accomplished in about 20 or 30 years. They set up lending libraries. They established and financed hospitals. They sponsored smallpox vaccinations. They began schools for the poor. They began schools for the blind. They began schools for the deaf. They set up the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. You might know it as the SPCA. They attempted other moral reforms against adultery, Sunday newspapers, so printing on the Sabbath on Sunday, uh, sexual impropriety, profanity, drunkenness. They began to, for they were some of the first people in history to promote a protection for factory children in industrial England. Um, they founded the British and Foreign Bible Society which is a missionary agency that's still around today. They founded the Church Missionary Society, which is another missions agency that's still around today. They, pro they founded the London Society for Promoting Christianity Among the Jews, a missionary society that's still around today. They founded the Colonial and Continental Church Society, now known as the Intercontinental Church Society, a mission society still around today. They formed the Pastoral Aid Society, which is still around today. They started the Sunday School Movement. How many of you have heard of Sunday School? Um, they published in their free time a magazine of theological and devotional articles. They founded Freetown in Sierra Leone, South Africa, as a center for gospel advancement and abolition and is now the capital of a country in Africa. And its most famous member, William Wilberforce ended the slave trade in England. How many of you have heard of William Wilberforce? I think we imagine this solitary hero that fought the powers and did it all by himself, where in reality, William Wilberforce had a team, dare I say, a family around him doing life together that together 
were the vehicle that God used to redeem and restore 19th century England. Family is the vehicle that God wants to use to restore uh, this region, our neighborhoods, the nations. And I feel like God wants to release people in here who are signing up to say, hey, I don't want to do life on my own anymore. I want to do life in the context of family because I believe that family is what God wants to use to change the world. And it's more fun that way, too. How many of you want to do stuff alone? It's boring after a while. We want to do this together. Um, and someone can come up to the keys. Uh, and so we're actually, uh, this is really practical, but we're in this series on, called Food, where we, our second value as a church is community, and we really want to see this arrow of community go up in this church family. And so we, we're going to email out, we're going to put it on social media. We have 12 food challenges that we're going to challenge our body to, okay? And so there are challenges like bringing a meal to someone in need. Uh, there are challenges like having a multi-generational meal where you either invite somebody over of a different generation than you or take them out to eat. Um, taking out somebody that doesn't go to church to eat. So there are 12 food challenges, and we have 12 of them because there's 12 weeks in the series, but we want to leave it up to you uh, in terms of how and when uh, you feel like God's inviting us to do this. But we want to see this arrow of family and community go up. Um, Pastor Mark mentioned signing up for community groups. You can do that online. Um, I'm going to share one last story, and then we're going to pray and respond to what the Holy Spirit's saying to us. This story is a little bit closer to home. It's my in-laws, uh, the Trings, who some of you know. They gave a season of their life uh, to begin to welcome in uh, foster kids into their home. They decided to be a foster family uh, for a season. And I mean, I could tell any one of the stories. They're, they're just crazy. But one particular story is they took in this young three-week-old girl named Rose. And uh, they, they take in Rose. And what had happened is her, her parents were part of corporate America and ended up just making some bad deals and ended up falling into a drug ring uh, and just made some really poor decisions. And so one time the cops came into their home based on a call. Um, they found them incapacitated. And so they took uh, this young girl, Rose, from them. And then Rose, at three weeks old, winds up in the loving arms of Mama and Papa Tring. And mom and dad Tring uh, start to build a relationship uh, with Rose's parents. Uh, and they start to realize that Rose's parents feel really awful because their, their child had gotten taken away. They felt that really what was the conviction of the Lord fall on them for their lifestyle. And so the Trings realized this, start to really intentionally pray uh, for this family. And then they kind of started to break the foster rules and started to invite this couple over to their home. And this, foster, this couple uh, saw the way that the Trings did a life and did family together. Ultimately, this couple started coming to their community group. They gave their lives to Jesus, completely restored, and, were, and the, the Trings got both the sadness and the joy of handing Precious Rose back to them, and she was reunited with them. And they stayed engaged in the Tring's life. Ultimately, they were even there for the adoption of uh, the, the daughter that now is in the Tring's home, Mercy. But this is what it looks like for family to be the vehicle that God wants to use to redeem and restore the world. There's something so powerful about the body of Christ being together.